Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's HOB webinar, the post-pandemic readiness, five strategic priorities to succeed in the new world. Uh, my name is Leslie Hornoon, and I will be the moderator on today's uh, session. And I am joined by our three HOB panelists. Um, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Andre, if you maybe want to start with a brief introduction. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Uh, my name is Andre Bueno. I'm a partner in the Transactional Services Advisor Group of HLB Brazil. I have 27 plus years of experience in both audit and uh, and M and A, and also also other um, financial advisory solutions, and also some specialization in M and A, and also um, restructuring process, which includes cost management. And I'm I'm honored to to be here with you guys. Thank you, Jim. All right, thank you, Leslie. And uh, so, all welcome to my home today. So, this is our new reality, right? So, I am Jim Burke. I'm global advisory leader for HLB International, and uh, I'm also a partner here at Witham, uh, with a focus pretty much off on offering advisory and uh, technology services. Thank you, Tom. Well, I guess that leaves me. Well, welcome to my home. Also, uh, my name is Tom Barry. I'm managing partner at Greenhouse and Jenks. Uh, the HLB affiliate out here in Los Angeles. And uh, our firm uh, serves mostly privately held uh, entrepreneurial organizations and nonprofit businesses. So uh, happy to be here today and share some of our own experiences and knowledge. Great, thank you. Um, so just a brief note to the audience. If you have any questions for our panelists today, uh, you can uh, put those in the Q&A box, which should be in the right-hand corner of your screen. And um, when, if questions come in, then throughout the session, we will pause to, to get to those. Good, so let's get started. Um, as we're moving through the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we are starting to see a glimpse of what is most likely going to be the, the post-pandemic situation. And um, we described this in our latest, uh, latest report. And maybe Jim, I can start uh, with you and could you maybe give your perspective on this? Sure, Leslie, thanks. So uh, obviously all of our worlds have changed around the globe and this is something that's been very unique, right? This hasn't happened in the past. Uh, every continent we go to, every country we go through, all of us are at different stages in this post-pandemic world. You know, we had thought here in the US that we were sort of getting close to that post-pandemic and now we have a resurgence in certain uh, certain states within our country. So we're looking towards a very different world going forward, a very different way to do business. And, you know, we, we've all learned a lot over the last three to four months on how to adapt, how to, how to, how to quickly change, how to be agile, uh, how to you know, move very, very quickly towards change. And, and those of us that have invested in technology and infrastructure uh, in this new remote world, uh, embracing the cloud concept, uh, have, I wouldn't say we didn't miss a beat, but we got along better than others. So it's going to be very challenging, absolutely, in this post-pandemic world. We are learning how we're going to adapt to change. For some, it's a very scary, it's a very scary world. I know many of our staff, they're afraid to come back. They're afraid to come back to the office for working in an environment that is very different than the environment that they left behind. So just some initial thoughts there about about this 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 uncertainty this new post-pandemic world so is there maybe um I'm i was sorry, going to go jump ahead. in there leslie on the uh, you know as a, a fellow american here with jim and, and to kind of pile on some of the things that he talked about is i think one of the oh, post pandemics interesting because i still think we're really we're not certainly not on the other side of it yet and i think the prospect of duration or how long this is going to last is is really starting to show itself here um, in Los Angeles, um, as we were just chatting before the call, we started to, we've been locked down pretty much for three and a half months here. We started to open up a little bit and just yesterday they started to close things down again. So I think that the um, the volatility of this is here to stay. And, you know, Jim used the word agile. Um, and I think that's really what we all need to be as we work to uh, adjust to the, to the rapid news cycle of what happens with this virus, not only uh, in our local communities, but within our businesses and uh, within our firms, within our households, it really requires us every day to kind of wake up and be able and ready to change, uh, frankly, on a moment's notice and be prepared for that change. So that's been one of the biggest challenges in maintaining our energy along the way to do it. I think people, 
uh, I can speak for myself. We got to late April, early May, and I think we thought we had a lot of this figured out. Um, and then uh, here in the U.S., we had a variety of civil unrest that occurred, and then the virus has started to come back up. So it's really been uh, an interesting time, to say the least. Yes. Um, yeah, do, do you I, speak I, to the... Yeah. No, I, I was going to say, Les, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, you know, I think that for Brazil and, and South America, it's pretty much the same thing. So, you know, people are still scared of this, you know, or at least anxious for this, what is about to come with this new normal. You know, uh, people are, you know, a little bit afraid of getting back to the office, although they are you know, tired to get locked at home. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, um, we need to get prepared for what is coming and perhaps uh you know in our minds realize that is, is the new world is, is expecting us so i think it's pretty much what you know we have just said that's pretty much that yes thank you and andre a couple of days ago we spoke about uh, societal tensions that have arised in the in uh, recent months and how the pandemic has uncovered many inequality issues and you gave some examples here about brazil um, are there any of those that uh, you could share? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, obviously, you know, with that, review some of the issues we had in our country. Just, you know, some, you know, problem we had with our health system. So, uh, you know, we we're not ready for face a, a situation like this. So we had to to implement quite rapidly a, a, a response to to contain the uh, the virus. Uh, also. Um, you know, it, it's famous that Brazil has these, um, these you know, they, uh, our social condition, you know, they're differential between, you know, poor and rich. And that was a little bit uh, increased over this, this period because, um, you know, they initially uh, it was, it was, you know, a thought that the COVID-19 was sent for rich people because they are able to travel abroad and then they bring the virus to Brazil. But it was not like that. So, Poor people suffer a lot. So nowadays, out of the 15, 7K people that ha have died, I would say that 60% or 70% comes for the lower classes. So, and, and this is, was a bit, little bit debate on the, not only on the, on the financial, but social, but also political uh, aspects because it became political because, you know, some politicians really, they, they take the lead, they took the lead here to, um, to embrace and, and lead to, to contain the, the virus, to contain this, this situation. And I would say that we are now quite successful, um, but there is too many challenges. And I think that perhaps in all Latin America, we may have faced situations, you know, a similar situation. You know, Ecuador was, you know, was, was terrible. Uh, I, I, I read something about, you know, some other countries, but I think that, you know, pretty much for South America, you know, this, the, the social differential is the, these, these classes was key to that, you know, that arose during this the, the pandemic. You look, Leslie, at the disruption on our economies as a result of COVID-19, right? I mean, so, so, so Andre is from South America. You look at one of the largest airlines, I think the largest airline in South America, Latam, yeah. right? And Latam yeah. a few weeks ago filed bankruptcy, right? So the largest, yeah. strongest airline in South America wasn't able to survive. We look at airlines globally around the world laying off thousands and thousands of employees, not flying, international borders closed. You know, so think about the disruption in our economies. You look throughout all of Europe. Yes, some of the EU is opening to other EU uh, residents to come and visit. But what is that doing to those countries that whose economy, whose GDP is being driven by tourism? You need tourism to open up globally around the world. You know, America, Australia, uh, uh, throughout all of Europe. Uh, it's it's so our economies. You know, I'm holding my breath as, as to what, what the economic, true economic impact will be on a going forward basis, because quite frankly, we don't know. The markets don't know. If you look at the stock markets around the globe, one day they're way up, next to the day they're way down. And tremendous things happening in the markets, things like Hertz car rental around the globe, right? Hertz filing bankruptcy, it's stock going up, it's stock going down. It, it's, this, this COVID-19 has wreaked total havoc on our traditional way we do business and our way of thinking about business. So again, we are learning every single day. I mean, you look at the unemployment numbers around the globe. Yes, they're starting to come back, but they're not coming back as quickly as we had anticipated, uh, as quickly as they had risen uh, uh, on the front end. So a lot of disruption going around around the globe, and it's gonna continue to happen uh, over the uh, 
uh, over the coming months. And uh, Jim, I think that disruption is also really any rules that apply in the past no longer apply today. Things that made sense or things that you use to to drive your decision making, you can't use them the same way anymore. And I think to me, that's that's the biggest challenge in this post pandemic world is is being able to assess things with really the best information you can get, which may not exist, but you need to come up with scenarios and plan for those scenarios. And once again, use the word agile, use the information that you have to do the best that you can do to be prepared to be agile to respond. Yeah, you know what? We're rewriting the book. We're It's like we're rewriting the manual on how to do business, right? It's not like we're, it's not like we're changing it. Like all the rules have changed in such a short amount of time. Absolutely amazing. So where do you see uh, the silver lining? Where is there room for optimism in this post-pandemic world? So lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities, lots of silver lining. I heard today, as a matter of fact, that Microsoft, Microsoft has decided earlier today to cease all retail operations of selling, uh, you know, the Microsoft stores around the globe. So think about that. What is the silver lining? They learned that, you know what, we're better off in that virtual world. We're better off online. That investment, that change that we had gone down. So, so you know, think about this. Where's the silver lining? Those companies that were not in the cloud, hopefully now it resonates. You need to be in the cloud. You need to revisit, take a look at technology. Take a look at technology's role in helping your business to survive on a going forward basis, right? So there's so many pieces, but... As long, you know, we keep going back to being agile, being able to to change quickly. As long as you're agile, as long as you're able to, you know, read that silver lining, understand that messaging that's there, maybe we'll all be bigger and stronger when this is done and we'll be doing business differently than we had thought we were going to be doing business just three months ago. If you don't look for the silver lining, there's, you know, it, it's going to bear you down in, in a tough way. And I think that also when you look at, from a societal point of view, uh, there's a, a multitude of silver linings, whether it's family oriented, environmentally oriented, commerce oriented. There's there's a lot of it's changed the way we live and we work in 90 days. And now we have to kind of catch up to that. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity in there. So it's our chance to reinvent ourselves. Right. It's our chance to you know going into this, going into the uh, into the pandemic. You know, we always used Office 365 for the longest time. We use video. But quite frankly, it wasn't embraced, right? It, it was there, we had it, it was a great feature to have. And we looked at it, adoption for all of our staff and it was it was like down here. Once the pandemic hit, man, it took a pandemic to get our staff to embrace video technology, to embrace this remote work concept. But today, it's like this is commonplace. What we're doing today, this is how we're communicating with our team members in the field. This is how we're communicating with our uh, with our clients. We're doing new client meetings like this and using video. So all the things that we didn't think we'd be using video for, we're doing it now. It's, it, it is education, it's learning, it's becoming a clear replacement for that traditional way in which we learned so long to do business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's gonna be, the, it's gonna be the same for Brazil. So, you know, pretty much that. So we see, many in my field, m and so we are seeing a lot of uh, opportunities or investment funds looking at uh, healthcare or life sciences and other opportunities because they see that this is going to be the you know what's going to drive the the economy the growth. Um, obviously, you know some of the of the changes we have faced on you know increasing the delivery services, increasing the uh, the way as we communicate, as Jean said, so pretty much this is how we are doing business. This is how we communicate, how we deliver projects, whatever. So this is the this is the new trend, and uh, we need to embrace that as we are embracing. And uh, and I believe I'm I'm quite sure that this is going to be you know how we're going to do business going forward, and we need to to, to stick to that. So I think that's that's pretty much that. Thank you, Andre. That actually is a really nice bridge to um, our last next slide here. And um, interestingly enough, in the fourth quarter of 2019, when we conducted our global survey of business leaders, we've asked them the question what they uh, they thought of as the characteristics of future business models. And um, the, the chart that you see here on the screen is basically the outcome of that question. And I think that many of you would agree that um, the pandemic and especially the circumstances under lockdown has accelerated the adoption of some of these uh, models. 
Jim, you already uh, mentioned team for, Teams, for example. Um, everyone has been working remotely. There has been a, a sharp shift towards the cloud. Uh, people are working in much much more flexible ways. And um, in in some ways, the, the question that we asked late last year and the, the answers that were given for uh, what they thought of as the future has, has been accelerated through uh, through the last couple of months. So so Leslie, to that point, so let's think about this. This survey was done before the pandemic, right? We surveyed yes. business leaders around the globe. And who would have thought? that that future that we refer to what would the business model be in the future who would have thought we were referring to three months four months five months from the date of the survey and look at some of the answers mobile uh, on the cloud a flexible workforce man it couldn't have been more flexible right because a hundred percent of our workforce was remote for the last four months so literally this this question this survey that we did was a was a real eye opener for us. When we went back and revisited, we're like, my God, this this really talked about the importance of all of these things happening very very quickly. So as I said before, if a company was agile and able to move quickly, either they were on the cloud or they got in the cloud. Either they were decentralized or they were not. Did they embrace the remote uh, workforce, the flexible workforce? If they didn't, they struggled. They, so all of these things needed to happen very, very, very quickly in all of our businesses to be uh, to to survive during this period of time. And that is the silver lining, Jim, because if this didn't occur, you would have done the same survey in December of 20 and had the same thing, but the needle wouldn't have moved much. Yes. 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 So that brings us to the question, what's next, right? Um, in, in our report, the post-pandemic readiness, we have identified stra five strategic priorities. And um, I would like to deep dive into each of those uh, with you now. And the first one, digital acceleration. I think, Jim, that has your name written all over it. Uh, absolutely. So this is a space I live in every single day, every single day. Now we may spell it differently around the globe, digitalization, whether in the UK or whether in the US, Australia or South America, it doesn't matter. It comes down to digitalizing our roadmap for business. The bottom line is technology needs to be there to drive. So we need to view technology as a strategic asset for all of our businesses not as an expense, not as a cost of doing business, because without it, without making the right moves, uh, we're going to have issues. So when we take a look at this number one, digital acceleration. Does your business have a digitalization roadmap? I will tell you, if you did not have a digitalization roadmap prior to the pandemic, you need to have one now. One of the first things I see companies doing uh, as they come out, as, as stay-at-home orders are being lifted around the globe, Business leaders, C-suite executives are meeting, they're talking about, they're re-examining their technology roadmap, right? Their digitalization roadmap. So those technologies that were important three months ago, four months ago, not that they're not important today, things like AI, robotics, that is all so important, but we're going back to basics. Do we have the technologies to allow our staff to work remotely? How about dealing with legacy systems? Legacy systems that we couldn't easily access during the pandemic. Do we have to go back and revisit them? Should we be taking those technologies and migrating those technologies to the cloud? So we're asking ourselves all those types of questions. And how about cybersecurity? You know, we focused on cybersecurity within our businesses and that was first and foremost a big issue. Now, how about all of the new things that we're learning about cybersecurity? as all of our staff are working remotely, as all of our technologies, all of our private and confidential information is out there uh, on laptops and other means, things that we didn't think about prior to the pandemic. So with that, do you have the right teams internally? Do your teams have the right skill sets needed to, to allow you to hit your strategic plan, to allow you to adopt quickly and be agile enough? You know, if you have an IT team for your business, their sole purpose is basically keeping the lights on, break and fix guys. I would argue you need a new IT team in your business. You need a technology team that thinks strategically. You need a technology team, quite frankly, that embraces the cloud. So many IT guys out there, they don't embrace the cloud concept. They're concerned about viruses and malware. Well, you know what? I am concerned about that as well. But there are lots of technologies out there to safeguard those assets. To me, technology should never be that hurdle, should never be that roadblock about taking your business to the next level. My technology team, I look, look within our own firm, 
the technology team needs to facilitate that process. They need to facilitate that strategic plan. If, if we are now rewriting our strategic plan and how we could be a leaner, meaner organization going forward and how we can adopt to this change, technology plays a such an important role in that entire, in the entire process. If your infrastructure uh, is not cloud enabled, if your infrastructure is not ready, you know what, now you should be re-evaluating that as you're back in your office, as you're looking at, I would regroup, I would brainstorm like we do on an audit. I would brainstorm what worked over the last three and a half months? What didn't work over the last three and a half months? What should we be doing differently with respect to our technology to allow our business to remain relevant way into the future and never be impacted regardless of whatever pandemic or natural, uh, natural disaster may impact our businesses. You know, I, Jim, one of the things that I see too is that the people who had this, that this shutdown or work from home was a non-event, right? If anyone who could check all these boxes or most of these boxes, and, and I can speak for our firm, you know, we closed we closed our doors on a Tuesday and on Wednesday was no different than the Monday. For, so it was, we, were, we didn't know how ready we were. And I think that the digital part of it is, is an, an, an underinvested area for some firms, but it's also one of the easier parts to solve in all this because you can you can kind of throw money at it um, if if you have it um, to get in there. The other part of it that's a challenge, and maybe it's a bridge to the next slide there, Leslie, is is the impact of how um, we look at how it impacts the workforce and the cultural changes that that go in there. Because you made the reference of you know everyone who's using Office 365 or video conferencing, and and it was here, right? And maybe it was trudged along. And then all of a sudden it was here, right? And some of the old guard who would never, you know, they, they didn't believe it. They could never work from home. You know, the young folks are crazy. They didn't have a choice but to get on board and get on board in a day. And, uh, and they realized, you know what, actually I can work from home. Um, and that creates a lot of different impacts to the workforce. Um, one of the questions on here is what, how do we drive cultural shift towards this for the agility? Uh, the world changed it for us. So you're either with it or you're out because if you can't adapt to the, the digitalization uh, of what's going on here, you're not going to be able to be a, a player. And I think, you know, when we look at the workforce, it does a lot of different things for us. Technology does. First of all, we now have a borderless talent pool where historically, you know, we're in Southern California and Los Angeles. Um, prior to this, we did have about 10 percent of our employees were elsewhere, Nevada, South Carolina. Uh, Chicago area, different places. We were able to do it, um, but they were always a little bit on the outside, if we're honest with ourselves, I think. They weren't the people who we saw in the office every day. Now they're actually the leaders in our firm because they're the ones who know how to work remotely. They're the ones who have uh, already lived and operated this way. So they're a great asset to our firm today. So now we can we can recruit anyone from anywhere that we want. And now we just have to deal with some of the administrative challenges maybe on that in regard to local labor laws or wage differentials and stuff. But the technology has made it an even playing field. And I think the other side of that too is I talk about the old guards. How do we get them to shift? Now we have people who may have been looking to retire um, because they didn't want to adapt the technology. They've now been forced to and said, hey, you know what? I can actually work a little more. I can work a few hundred hours a year remotely from my golf house in Arizona or whatever the case may be. So the resources that we have um, from a talent pool have just opened exponentially, I think. And um, one of the things that, that kind of drives in there and the question here about a leaner workforce model is that we are now able to flex a bit more and having people with flexible schedules with different types of schedules. You may have someone who wants to work a third of a year or a half a year or whatever it is, you can lean on these different people and these different talent resources at different times to flex with your business. Whether you're a service business or otherwise, uh, the opportunities are endless, I think, in regard to talent. Um, which, you know, the question of how does, what does the future of work look like? I think we're living in it right now. I, I think that we, to, to go back to your question, or the survey slide that you presented earlier, those three things, three or four things that were printed out, flexibility, uh, remote working, all those different items that are in there. We're living it now. That is the future. The future is here. I think the biggest challenge that we have to face um, is the last question on here is what is the impact on our staff well-being and, and mental health is a word that we use a lot. Um, I think that that is our biggest challenge. Um, right now, um, the ability to do work is there. Um, everyone's actually been highly productive, whether you're in the service industry or otherwise. Um, 
the challenge is the fatigue that is setting in. And we're seeing that more and more as we enter into a three and a half, four months of this situation and the prospect of it being another 12 months or more um, is really bearing heavily on people. So what do organizations, what can organizations do to implement programs, to drive culture, uh, to maintain collaboration, um, to do all these different elements that you were able to much more easily do over in an office where you had a lunch or a meet and greet um, or the ability to just check in on someone for a minute or two to see how they're doing. Those have all changed. So we need to figure out that social dynamic of the workspace, how to maintain culture and evolve culture, be agile in regard to our cultures uh, to do it. Because my concern is while productivity is there, if the mindset isn't there along with it, the productivity of built, uh, gains are going to be lost in the in the near term. Um, I, yeah, I know, Jim or Andre, your experiences in those, but I, I, I hear it everywhere, not just uh, in my clients or in Los Angeles. It seems to be a global issue. Yeah, yes, yes, it is. It is, Tom, because you know, obviously, when these these lockdown come down to Brazil and, and how we're going to work, you know, remotely, what's kind of uh, scary for some people say, you know. At, at least at, at the beginning, oh, how this going to work? You know, are, are those people going to be very efficient or productive or whatever? But what we realized was, you know, was, was a good surprise that at least from the LTB Brazil, so our efficiency or productivity really increased. So people were more efficient at the home. They really love to work at home, and they and there are some other you know, investment banks in Brazil. They are implementing home office. You know, for for good. So they are they really uh, you know they embrace this this workforce transformation and they uh, obviously put it together you know, tools to monitor the efficiency productivity, but also invest in their well being. So invest in their, their to to balance and you know um, life quality and, uh, and and balance work and and, and and private life. So I think that's you know this is pretty much the you know, how we're, we're gonna work going forward and this is you know as you said so it's here to stay so that's how we're going to work you know from, from now on i think that's pretty sure. much that and look at look at some of the things that we learned very early on during the pandemic when our when all of our staff left the office so when they left the bricks and mortar and they went to their homes we learned very quickly that in order to be functional in order to be productive we had to try to replicate that that existing work work environment. So we ended up moving a lot of our equipment. We allowed staff to take home that equipment. We made concessions with our staff to go out and buy dual monitors, go out and buy keyboards and mice to try to replicate that environment that they used to have at work. You know, and look look at that workspace, that environment. What will the future of work look like when they go back to work? I honestly don't think we're going to need the level of office space that we had prior. I mean, it's common sense, right? That I think we'll continue to be in all of the cities that we're in. But as our leases come up for renewal four years, five years, 10 years down the road, I think we're going to be seriously looking at the amount of space we have. You know, in the past, the philosophy is we always needed one spot for everyone. We build out space that way. We went over the last couple of years, we looked at hoteling. What do we do during hoteling? We put lots of staff in one room around the table so they can all collaborate and all work together. The hoteling concept is gone, right? Now we're now we're spreading people apart. We're social distancing, and people are realizing, you know what? This remote work, we're better off continuing our remote work from home uh, because we're finding we can be as productive as we were in the office. So work work workforce transformation is moving so quickly, and as Tom alluded to, it's you know, what's happening in their brains, what's happening in their mind, what's happening with their well-being of people uh, that are our, our workforce today and will be tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are, as a firm, and we can go to the next slide, Leslie, but you know, as a firm, we're in the uh, fortunate or unfortunate position that we have new office space that we signed prior to the pandemic, the pandemic, so we're building it out. But it's actually been a great opportunity because even before this, we had the we, we were planning for a remote flexible workforce because that's where we saw the future going so while it's not cubes and it's not big uh, big rooms that everyone's sitting there but there's a variety of spaces for people when they do pop in and i envision instead of the five-day work week in the office you're going to have a two or three day or some measure of a work day in the office where people come together for certain points and then they go back and they put their heads down work in their home office and that kind of social 
collaborative culture building work that needs to happen will happen in the office space or some variation therein. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, if we move on to our uh, third strategic priority, consumer acumen, and I guess I can speak to the context of uh, this priority from a marketing uh, point of view. Um, when it comes to consumer demands, and I guess that anyone on, on the webinar listening, you might recognize it as a consumer yourself, right? How over the last couple of months, your, your needs and wants have shifted and how you might buy differently from the brands that you normally buy from, et cetera. And what the long-term impact of the pandemic will be on the sentiment is, is difficult to predict at the moment. Um, and therefore, um, consumer insight and really understanding the, the consumer of the future is so key to, uh, to build in that agility and to make sure that you can move with those uh, rapid changes in, in wants and needs by consumers, right? So uh, when, when we think about um, uh, customer loyalty, for example, that means that keeping up with what the trends are and what those consumer needs are in order to maintain relevance so that you can keep them loyal to your brand. And when it comes to trust, um, their consumers have different concerns today than uh, they did prior to the pandemic, right? So especially for, um, especially I guess for B two C brands, it is important that you communicate with um, with your with your customers' transparency about what you're doing to keep them safe, or maybe how policies have changed. We've, we've spoken a, a lot about uh, digital acceleration, of course, and how everything is, is uh, currently uh, online and on the cloud and, and remote. Um, there's been a, a, a big boost in e-commerce, of course, as no one is able to, to shop in store anymore. Um, but then it's important to uh, look at, for example, your customer services, because as more people are buying online, they might want to know more about your, um, your return policies or your... Um, uh, your your delivery policies, things like that, right? So when it cons comes to consumer acumen, um, I guess there's a lot to learn from the data that you already collect from customers. And uh, maybe in a moment, Jim, you can speak to how you can use the data that you already have within your company to learn about consumer trends. Um, but also, uh, it, it's it's about uh, well, it's it's about maintaining the the strength of your brand and making sure that you keep that loyalty of customers. And Tom, I know that um, in in LA you have quite a lot of B two C brands that that the firm works with. So maybe there are some examples of clients that uh, have done really well in this space that you could share. Sure. Yeah, and you know it's super interesting. So first of all, we have a significant food and beverage practice uh, at our firm. Southern California is really kind of a, a, a testing ground, if you will, for a lot of different food uh, throughout the world. It's multicultural environment promotes that. We have two clients, that, uh, and it's uh, one's in the restaurant business, and I think we're seeing this in other parts of the country too. But as consumer sentiment changed, but there was significant brand loyalty, right? That, but those people could no longer go and eat in at the restaurant anymore, or even picking it up in. Uh, was a little more troublesome. Restaurants are starting to shift to kind of a grocery store model, if you will, where they're taking all of their goods, all of their meats and their fresh, their access to this higher quality food, packaging them in a way with with uh, ingredients and instructions that allows the individual to actually take this high quality food product, make it at home at a reduced price. So you can go pick up you know, a family meal that comes with everything that you need in a prepackaged thing. Um, and you end up getting, it's even for a, a fool like me in the kitchen, you end up getting a high quality meal as opposed to what you would buy at the supermarket. And you're also able to support the brand that you want, right? I think there's a certain loyalty that customers are saying, hey, I like restaurant X. I hope it stays open through all this. I'm going to keep trying to support them in any way that I can. And you're getting the quality that you expect. So I think that's that's one example of, of, a, of a business segment that's starting to shift. Um, another one I think is that we're seeing, and, and you say B2C, well, a lot of our B2C businesses actually went, you know, first there was there was a stop off, if you will, at a grocery store or some other distribution point as opposed to direct to consumer. And we're seeing a lot of our brands go direct to consumer now. Why, why get the, uh, we have a big beverage client, um, why get the supermarket involved? If people are buying stuff through, uh, you know, online delivery from a grocery store, there's a lot of people touching that they can ship directly to the consumer at home. They have the brand trust, they have the brand loyalty, the consumer trusts the brand. And also, by the way, people are going to buy things that they trust today 
because if they don't, the process to go try a new product is a little more cumbersome, I think, than it was in the past, yeah, right? Exactly. So as mm -hmm. a seller, you have the opportunity for some stickiness with your consumer, but you need to deliver on your brand promise. And so now this one beverage company I'm talking about is doing direct to consumer, um, and it's actually cheaper than if you bought it in the grocery store. It's delivered right to your door. Um, you can subscribe to it, so it shows up, you know, in every uh, your period that you want. Kind of Amazon does a lot of subscription model stuff, but this is direct for the manufacturer. So those are two specific examples as, as we've seen customers or businesses adapt to consumer needs and how they change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that for, for Brazil, it's pretty much the same. So, you know, a lot of restaurants, so fancy restaurants, they invest a little bit, a little more on the, uh, on these promoting the good food to deliver it. You know, fresh at home, so you have the you know same thing that you're gonna have at a restaurant you can have at home. Uh, but I think that one of the things that were really important in Brazil, because obviously most of them uh, investing in advertising in Instagram or any other social media, but they are really concerned on on transmitting the right message to the customers or to be uh, to be uh, you know to not engage into political or any other aspects not to to be as, as more as more neutral as possible to to be able to expand their presence and not to be picking for you know for any any positions or or anything else so this is what very successful and uh, you know, there are some examples that the owner transmitted the, the wrong message through social media or whatever and the business went down so you know i think that's something that you know in, in this new world that we are always exposed to anything we say everything is online you know, i think this i would just add that today to the strategy instead of obviously we need to do our business well but it, it, it is incredible it's a new world there are other things that you need to, to think about yeah, you look at you look at Leslie. You look at the buying habits, right? That uh, that have quickly changed over the last three months. I know. So here in the U.S., we have a big shipper, right? You have UPS, the box truck, right? So that box truck is pulling up in front of my house every single day, delivering something, whether it's paper towels or toilet paper or groceries. Uh, so the way consumers uh, shop, the way consumers buy, what it is we are selling is quickly changing. Whether it's being delivery through UPS or DHL around the globe. So we have to be able to adapt to that. And you, you, you mentioned early about technology and about security. Uh, consumers are concerned. You think about a few years ago with GDPR throughout the, throughout the EU, the concern uh, was about data and, and leakage of data. It, it couldn't be any more prevalent today. C consumers are going to do business with companies that will safeguard their data, safeguard their assets, right? Not share their confidential and private data with anyone. A consumer wants to have a very seamless transaction with a business today. They want to be able to return product seamlessly without jumping through hoops in order to be able to do it. So those businesses that make it super simple, utilizing technology to interact with the future consumer, those are the ones that will reap the biggest reward as a result of this new world that we're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking about uh, consumer data and, and privacy, Jim, um, I, I guess that one of the, the easiest ways to, to better understand your customers is through looking at the data you already have on them, right? And oh. and that's one way of, of creating or building in that agility to shift with whatever the the needs are. Oh, absolutely. So I, I often use this analogy. I often talk about let's visualize that data. We all live in a data world today. We're grabbing, as business owners, we grab so much data from our web presence, from uh, customers' history, their buying habits, their purchasing habits, all of that. So let's try to uncover those stories that are embedded in the data that we don't otherwise visually see. So when we utilize tools and technology out there to really tell the business owner the stories that are embedded in the data, it will allow us to better plan uh, future sales and marketing efforts around that. So businesses that are in a position to understand the stories that are embedded in the data will be those that that thrive going into the future. And Jim, to a point you made earlier, that data from the last 90 days is going to tell a different story than it did from two and a half years ago or whatever time frame you pick. So I think that the importance of contemporaneous data and the ability to read it and use it is, is paramount to success here.
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Tom, absolutely. So you think about it, the buying habits in the last 90 days have totally changed, right? I mean, look at all of you, all of your families, all the look at how our consumers are buying your products. I opened the session by talking about how Microsoft is, is literally eliminating that retail storefront globally around the world effective today. So think about that. That means that that model that people purchase through a store, that's gone, that's history. Now they're being forced online. So to your point, Tom, the last 90 days, if you can uncover the story that's buried in your data on how consumers purchase your product in the last 30 days, you're setting yourself up for success. One of the things that, that is a challenge just in regard to consumers, and I'll talk about it from just a firm point of view or uh, professional services organizations, is our ability to actually touch clients, if you will. Um, we are in a personal service business and relationships are there. So what we've really, really been trying to do as a firm is take that data, try to get real-time survey of what our clients are looking for. We've done a lot of internal surveys as a firm uh, to see, you know, what's driving you today. Is it the changes in government regulation? Is it cash flow? Is it uh, all these, you know, going back to work and how we can hear that and then reach back out to our clients on a service thing and tell them that we hear you, we're listening and how can we react. So I think from a professional service point of view, you got to use that data like you're talking about, Jim, and then also figure out how to reach it out. Obviously, Microsoft as a whole, and online companies are not akin to professional services firms in the customer relationship, if you will. But the data is still the, the driving thread between all of those that are important in understanding what your clients need. Absolutely. And also, Tom, trying to figure out those things that we did that were unique in the bricks and mortar world and now how to replicate that if it can even be replicated in this new digital world. Sidewalk sales and after hours events and cocktail receptions, things meant to attract awareness. We just need to be agile. We just need to be able to change quickly and understand how we can allow our consumers to still feel that connection with the business in just a different way, approaching it from a different uh, direction. Yeah. Thank you. Um, moving to the, the fourth strategic priority from our report, um, cost management. Andrew, would you uh, like to elaborate on this one? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And I think that you know, cost management was something in the agenda of everybody, you know, for you know such a long time. And obviously, during this this COVID nineteen issue, you know, it became more and more uh, important and more and more uh, essential because obviously, um, with the the eruption the eruption of the economy, you know, some, you know, the top line you couldn't, you know, it's out of your control. So obviously, you can you know implement some uh, safety strategy, whatever. But again. So there's something that's not under your control. So then you need to look at, you know, inside your company and to look at you know, and, and analyze, you know, what can be managed to be uh, to be reduced, obviously, without compromising, um, you know, uh, efficiency, compromising quality. And and this is going to fall, you know, pretty much on what, you know, Gene started to say about digitalization. Obviously, you need to, you know, some of the trends you may need to implement in your business to, to save costs, just like, you know, RPA, so artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain, or whatever. So, however, you know, but this is something that needs to be done very carefully because, you know, at some point, you may end up Cut in some costs, and it might be represent a self sacrifice that you know from the for the long term they will not you know they, they will not be useful for you because uh, perhaps you know some of the things that you did you need to either you know incur incur on those costs again or you know re retransform your, your business again. But also with that being in mind, so perhaps you on a global you know global world in a global business you need to think about. And, and look for uh, better jurisdictions to 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 operate or to leave you know to manage legally uh, to leave profits to leave cash or to to look at jurisdictions where the labor force is cheaper or you can from the you know you, you put you can implement some cost shared centers that you you can manage some uh, operations from from these jurisdictions and again saving costs um, and Again, looking at your business to understand in the, within your, your your production process, your operations, what can be automated? 
Um, can we implement artificial intelligence for uh, inventory measurement, for example, or can we uh, implement other, you know, automation for robotics for the production, you know, to save to, to save costs or to to save labor costs. Um, so I think that this is pretty much what we need to, uh, as a as a whole strategy. So you need to think about, you know, or to assess efficiency because you know you may end it up perhaps that one of the benefits let's say uh, of this COVID-19 is that you're going to look at some processes or look at some activities that you say well we don't need that or actually you know there's way I can do that more efficiently or now these people are, I, I don't need to have all those people sitting in a you know in a, in, a, in a table here in the office they can work remotely so I can save occupancy costs so I think that's pretty much you know, some of the 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 the, the strategy that we need to think about, you know, to um, minimize costs and save cash. So I, I think that's pretty much answer all those questions because um, that you know came up or our those tough questions because at the end of the day there are some key messages. Obviously, technology technology will make you more efficient and save costs and. Uh, you you do a proper assessment of the the current processes and how efficient those those uh, those professionals or those 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 process will will be um, will be running you know as from as from now. Andre, I agree with everything you said there. I think one of the challenges that we're seeing amongst uh, our clients, at least here in Southern California, is anticipating what the future looks like. To go back to word being agile again. What's the what's the economic recovery going to look like, right? So at first yeah. there was a lot of talk about a V, which I, I think that's in the rear view, as a, at least as an opinion anyway. So a lot of talk about a W, right? That we've gone down, we've come up a little yeah. bit, how that's going to look. A lot of different economists prescribe to different theories, but that's one of the challenges that we see with our client base and even within the firm itself is when do we when do we start reinvesting for growth, or you know what's too soon? When do we got to pull back again? I think some of the other cost cutting things, Jim, you talked about real estate before. Um, that's that's a longer play, maybe a, an area that's a little harder to be agile in. But I think being able to plan for different scenarios on an economic rebound is going to be your most important thing to then implement your cost cutting things. Because you don't, the first question here, you don't want to cut to the bone and impact quality or culture or any of those things, right? Yeah. Uh, yep. But how long can you operate? above maybe what's necessary for the current economic state. So um, I think that the, the answer to all this is employing all those things that you talked about, Andre, but also having a couple different scenario plans out there as the economy uh, adjusts or vacillates with each of those uh, and, and how you deploy them and for how long. I think yeah. you, we look, look. all of us look right now at the costs that are being contained within all of our businesses. Travel, we look at our travel budget. Our travel is down significant. Uh, is that just for you not being on an airplane, Jim? Yes, it's, it's for me not being on an airplane. <laughs> my, my, my expense reports are virtually nothing. Um, I, also looking at looking at how we're spending on training and learning. And so we are all seeing massive amounts of cost savings within our business as a result of this pandemic. It's how much of it are we willing to continue going forward? How long do we hold off before jumping and traveling? How long do we hold off before that in-person training? Uh, all of that. So cost management, I think, is here to stay. I think, again, it was brought on us. It took a pandemic to get us to literally control all of this stuff. It's a, it's a matter of how long it will be controlled. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I would add that a discussion we had in Brazil, or we're seeing Brazil on the uh, on the rebound, or the economy kind of rebound, is that most, li most likely the, uh, the letter is going to be L. So, you know, Although we, we would love to see a, a V or even a W, but it's more likely to be an L. So well, I don't yeah. know how long that's going to take, but it's going to be a very, you know, a very slow recovery. You know, perhaps we're going to see something by mid 2021 or end 2021, being, being optimistic. It's hard to Thank disagree you. with you. <laughs> Um, just in the interest of time, we have about 10 minutes left till the uh, end of our webinar session, uh, which leads us to our our fifth um, strategic priority, which is supply chain reinvention. Um, Tom, earlier you spoke about um, agriculture and food and beverage companies. I think 
supply chain, of course, is incredibly important to them. Um, mm -hmm. Could you maybe elaborate on on this um, priority? Sure, and you know it's it's interesting. I think when the supply chain when COVID nineteen first came out, and obviously uh, the first large cases came out in China, and there was a lot of discussion about supply chain in Asia and how all that works. Well, I think that's a little bit of a moot point right now because supply chains are disrupted everywhere. And I even just look here in the United States. One of the biggest uh, industries impacted by COVID nineteen is actually the meat. Uh, industry, meatpacking, meat processing, um, for whatever the reasons would be, and I'm not a scientist or an epidemiologist, but uh, meatpacking plants have become a significant um, source of infection here in the U.S., um, and they've shut a lot of them down. And so, when, as I mentioned earlier, with big food and beverage practice, and when that supply chain for the for for meat, as an example, whether it's to restaurants or groceries or some other product gets disrupted and gets disrupted in such a significant way, um, it really has an impact all the way down uh, the, the supply chain, all the way to the consumer. So what can people do to adjust to that? And, and you know, each, each individual um, industry is going to have a different story, but I think the concept of spreading out supply chains and trying to avoid vendor concentrations to a degree possible are going to be more of a norm into the future. So you can displace your your risk that you have with it with a concentration and uh, I talked about meatpacking but it could also go to I think as we look forward in some of the scenarios that we're playing out is um, geographic uh, pandemic issues so um, I I was in Arizona just this past week big hotspot now maybe the global hotspot for uh, the spread of this virus right now so if you have if you're sourcing stuff out of Arizona just in here in Los Angeles it's not an uncommon distribution point how is that going to impact your local supply chain? What about your drivers and or what about your transport in there? So I think uh, businesses got to look at not just the global supply chain, but the local supply chain issues and how different hotspots go. Um, New York, uh, the state of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut um, are prohibiting, uh, well, not prohibiting, but people come from hotspots. I think Florida is one of them have to be quarantined for 14 days. How does that impact the supply chain, right? How are you thinking those things? So once again, I think that the name of the game, if you will, is creating more diversity in your supply uh, chain to mitigate different risks that can pop up. And um, that's what I see. We, I have, uh, we have one client that um, we have that uh, distributes printer toner uh, for home. It's actually mostly uh, to consumer, not to business. It was awesome. When the, when the world shut down, it was the business took off because the uh, everyone needed was printing at home now everyone's working from home everyone was buying ink and printer toner well the flip side of that story is the wuhan province of china is the primary source for printer toner in the world right so they had all this demand from their consumers the supply was blown so what are they doing to to try to mitigate that what they now have to do is buy more printer toner has a different working capital demand they're going to store more of it in the anticipation of disruptions or supply chain so significant disruption, and it needs, once again, agile business practices, and you need to adjust to a new reality in order to mitigate your downside risk. So we look at look at supply chain reinvention. Uh, I'll, again, I'll go back to technology because I will. It's my sort of my thing. I'll look at blockchain, utilization of blockchain, a blockchain's role going forward into the future, how quickly we can identify the source of where that product came and how quickly we can then reroute and buy similar products uh, from, from other suppliers that are maybe logistically closer to us in other areas of, of the planet that are not as impacted as a result of others. So technology will continue to have a huge role in supply chain reinvention. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. I think that's pretty much. You know, I agree with you know everything that you guys said. So I, I, at least for Brazil, you know, part of the reinvention. Was was due to pretty much what happened with COVID nineteen, with some suppliers, you know, um, entering a distressed situation. So there is some companies that had to, to act very quickly in replacing those, those suppliers and being creative in terms of how to to develop a new way new ways of getting products from one place to another and uh, to not to avoid disrupting their business even more. Yeah. I think it's just Thank once you. again another one of the legs of the table, if you will. And when you're looking at businesses and how they're being disrupted, um, whether it's the employees, the consumer, the technology, or ultimately your supply chain, they're all being impacted 
in a way that we all need to adjust and be agile and quick to make decisions because it's too slow yep. we can end up like the airline gym discussed in south america right that's right yeah. yep let's on. yep so it it comes down basically to to building in more agility within to i'm sorry i'm working from home as well like we're discussing and my cat wants to join the webinar i'm very <laughs> sorry about um yes okay that threw me off completely um yeah greater agility i think that it kind of comes down to building greater agility into the business in order to respond to to uncertainty and and fast moving um events um maybe i can uh, ask each of you to give your final thoughts on that sure so so yeah so, so right on the slide time time is now right is it too late? No, it's never too late. We're going through it. We've been through it. Hopefully we're on a downward slope really soon for those areas of the world that are not. Hopefully soon they will be. But there's no better time than right now. Address how agile you can be. From my perspective, how technology, look at how technology, the role technology can play in making a company more agile, being able to turn quickly. I, you know, I, I use the analogy all the time. It's very difficult to turn a cruise ship. It's very, very difficult. If you're in a rowboat, if you're in a canoe, it's very, it's very agile, it's very easy to turn. So that's what you wanna be able to do. You wanna be able to make quick decisions and quick reactions during periods of uh, like pandemics or natural disasters like this. Technology is key, having the right technologies in place. I think what I would add to that too, particularly in, well, in the face of the pandemic, is that you need to be agile, but this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, just because you made quick changes yesterday doesn't mean you've done your job. I think you got to wake up every day and be prepared to make new changes based upon the information available to you. The time is now, and the time is going to be tomorrow, and the time is going to be three months from now, et cetera. So I think paying attention, keeping yourself educated, and making informed decisions under different scenarios is is what agility is in this and it's it's a long game yeah yeah i agree with everything what has been said that i really love the definition that Tom that gave up uh, that this is a marathon on a screen i love that so because and, and that's it that's pretty much it because obviously sometimes it's, it's easy for us to think that okay we're gonna we're gonna make something now and, and that's it no it isn't because you know some of the changes are still you know, occurring, we, we 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 are making decisions as we know now, and that may change in the, a couple of months or 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 a year. But uh, but again, I think that technology will play a relevant role here. So and then and companies that are agile and able to anticipate some movements, they will thrive definitely. Yeah. So, so Leslie, you look at what we have done, the example that we have set at HLB, right? So the one of the things that we have done is we're encouraging all of our member firms around the globe to become future proof, right? For our clients. So we're, we are ourselves becoming future proof in order to allow our clients to become future proof. So we are trying to set ourselves up for that new world, for that new future to better serve all of our clients around the globe to be future proof yeah thank you jim um i think that concludes our session for today uh, for anyone on the webinar if you're uh, interested in uh what we discussed today and found it useful then please visit our website and download the full report um and that leads me to say uh oh i'm sorry we, we received a couple of questions but there was so much discussion going on that i didn't want to interrupt it we have your email addresses so we will get back to you on your questions via email um, and that leaves me to say a big thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Leslie. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you, everyone. Stay well, everybody. <laughs>